Hi, and thanks so much to Sam, Deborah and Kate for hosting this and organising such a fascinating conference. Hegel's philosophical approach is intuitively very satisfying if, like me, you train to study literature. From an early age as a literature student, you're, ta you're taught that texts have narrators and that these narrators are different from the author. For instance, a text might not have a single author or even a human one. You could discover the text written in gigantic letters on the surface of Mars or floating um, in the tea leaves at the bottom of the pot. No matter, all texts, these ones included, have a narrator. Now, the point about narrators is that they do two things, roughly. They establish a point of view, or points of view, and they establish a subject position or positions. The point of view is fairly straightforward. It's the answer to the question, who or what is the narrator? Is the narrator omniscient, omnipresent? Does it have a gender, race, or class? Um, is the narrator a character in a story, characters, and so on? Slightly more difficult to grasp is the notion of subject position, but this is where it gets really interesting, being a literature or any kind of art student, where the rubber meets the road, as they say, tediously, over and over again, in awful bureaucratic meetings where nothing is decided. I think that if you had to boil down what we do as humanities scholars into a single task, it would be identifying subject positions and working on them, which, by the way, makes me a good Hegelian, because that's what Hegelian philosophy is all about. So what is a subject position? The subject position of a text or artwork answers the question, who are you, the reader? In other words, what attitude towards itself does the text expect you to take? Think of a perspective painting. The vanishing points in the painting dictate where to place your gaze in order to make a 2D surface appear 3D. Your gaze is encoded into the picture surface. In the same way, perhaps, a flower's subject position is that of a bee. If it's painted with ultraviolet landing stripes, it tells you where to put your proboscis. This is the bad or good news of literary theory in a Lacanian, Althusserian nutshell. People come into the theory class with the expectation that you can make anything mean anything. You'll always get a certain essay on deconstruction that totally misinterprets it along these lines. No, that's what I call the pre-theory attitude. What you should leave the theory class with is the knowledge that not only is the interpretation of texts subject to all kinds of non-subjective constraints, but also a place for you has been pre-established by the text itself. It's like those maps with the little red arrow that says you are here. Now, Hegel's great insight is that attitudes, that ideas, is that ideas come bundled with attitudes. In other words, ideas code for subject positions. When you think an idea, the idea's thinkability as such depends upon assuming a certain attitude on the part of the thinker. So when a Hegelian wants to debate you, she doesn't argue the toss about the truth content of your claims. She makes a beeline for the subject position that your ide ideas code for and talks to that. Say welfare and you evoke a whole host of attitudes. Call it social security and it becomes very different. The Hegelian doesn't argue the toss about the value of supporting poor people. The Hegelian goes directly for the jugular of the attitude that the welfare concept codes for. It's a very disarming approach as a matter of fact. I try my best to use it all the time. Again, it's what I think the humanities were put on earth to do. Now, honing in on the subject position is literally disarming because it tends to be the unconscious of the idea, the idea's personality, as it were. And we sort of know from psychoanalysis that one's personality, how one appears to the other, is unconscious. So what happens when you hone in on the subject position is that you deprive it of its effectiveness. You collapse the idea and the attitude it codes for into a bundle by making them conscious. Now, this bundle is yet another idea, and guess what? Since ideas code for attitudes, this one is no exception. So off you go, Mr. Hegelian. You know how to figure out that one, and so on. It's called dialectics. It means that philosophy is the history of philosophy, not the superficial occurrence of ideas in time, but a temporality and a temporalizing that is internal, intrinsic to thinking as such. For instance, it has no reverse gear. Thinking is futural, since ideas don't know yet what they code for. That's what an idea is. Cue the spooky Heidegger music. Ideas, for Hegel, have a structural instability that I also attribute to objects. They have an intrinsic difference from themselves reflected in the rift between an idea and the attitude it codes for. Ideas are also archaeological evidence of the existence of at least one thing that is not an idea. People who have those ideas. Ideas don't float in some void, but are lived phenomenologically, which is why, of course, Hegel calls his history of attitudes that ideas code for the phenomenology of spirit.
Now there are ideas humans have about art, and these ideas code for attitudes, and these idea-attitude bundles are structurally unstable and teeter forwards opening up the future, so Hegel's history of aesthetics is the history of how human ideas about art, um, about what art is, code for attitudes, setting up unstable constructs that collapse into new ideas and fresh attitudes. Hegel's history of art basically goes symbolic, classical, romantic. Now we can track this history, argues Hegel, according to how humans have developed attitudes towards the objects of art, the painting, the canvas, the cave wall, the pen, the subject matter, all of it. Ideas concerning these objects, code for attitudes, the spiritual inside of art, as it were. In, um, in short, Hegel's history of aesthetics is the story of the eventual release of this spirit from the very materials that it used to understand itself and the, subject and the subsequent surpassing of art by philosophy when spirit becomes too heavy for objects to embody it. Now, in this talk, I'm going to use the terms spirit and spiritual rather than subject and subjective, first because Hegel uses them, secondly because I think those terms are interestingly provocative right now, and thirdly because um, subject is itself a kind of cheapening or reification of what we're aiming for here, which is more like an analysis of the withdrawn essence of things versus their manifestation for others or for the other. Now here's a word of warning. I'm not a Hegelian in the sense that I'm not a teleological thinker. I don't believe that the history of what Hegel calls spirit has an end, even a predictable end point, and I'm not endorsing Hegel's viewpoint concerning the defects of the symbolic, classical, and, and romantic phases. Indeed, I'm doing a bit of a Hegel with Hegel himself, since I'm interested in the fact that Hegel, as a romantic philosopher, is a very contemporary philosopher, insofar as we are still inside the romantic period, or were, until about two weeks ago. More on this later. How can we tell that we're still in the Romantic period? The fact that we're still in the Romantic period is why Slavoj Žižek can write an essay called What It Means to Be a Hegelian Today, why this title makes sense, even remotely. The Hegelian thinking of art, in other words, has an unconscious that is only now coming to light. This coming to light signals the collapse of the Romantic period, the long march of the isms, the most encompassing of which is consumerism, since the late 18th century, accompanied by the advent of modernity, the upsurge of industrial capitalism, and the subsequent geological shift we now call the Anthropocene, the fact that we have now entered a geological period in which humans have a direct effect on the substrata of their earthly reality. The Anthropocene has a very definite beginning, 1945, when a thin layer of radioactive materials was deposited on Earth's crust, in Earth's crust. The new period we enter, I claim, is an ecological one, which I call the time of hyperobjects, for reasons I'll make clear. In this period, a new phase of art, unpredicted, and indeed I shall argue unpredictable, by Hegel, <clears throat> comes about. This phase of art I call the asymmetric phase, again for reasons I shall make clear. Now here's an even broader word of warning. I'm not a Hegelian as far as ontology goes either. I'm an object-oriented ontologist, carefully trained in deconstruction, and before that, Marxism. For one, then, I'm a realist, not an idealist. In this, I'm a little more Kantian than Hegelian. There are places in the universe that thinking can't touch. I just don't accept that when I think this untouchability, I am touching it. This would be the Hegelian response to Kantianism. But unlike Kant and his correlationist legacy, I see this not as a reason to confine thinking to a little island of human meaningfulness, but rather to embark on a speculative journey amidst an irreducible plenum of discrete, unique, sparkling objects, whether they be snow crystals, arsenal, or a single photon. The fact that philosophy is now thinking ways out of the Kant-Hegel dyad is very significant as we enter the time of hyperobjects. I don't think it's an accident. I believe that this is the moment at which non-humans, sentient and otherwise, make decisive contact with humans, even those humans who have been living under the spells of modernity, capitalism, correlationism and technology. What we are witnessing today, in aesthetic terms, is the deconstruction of the Hegelian thinking of aesthetics, a deconstruction, or as Heidegger would say, a destructuring, according to the implicit qualities of reality itself, the plenum of unique objects that now impinge, Im, impinges on us, the plenum whose thinking some of us call ecological awareness or the ecological thought. So let's walk through Hegel's history of uh, philosophy, of aesthetics, knowing that it too codes for its own attitudes, not the least of which is the romantic end-of-history vibe in which we're all dressed up with nowhere to go, beautiful souls in the empty supermarket of anxiety. The way I'm going to narrate the phases of art 
is based on Hegel's historical approach, but since Hegel argues that history is internal to thinking, we can imagine the three phases Hegel outlines as recapitulated in any process of coming to terms with human creativity. In other words, the symbolic phase need not be so-called oriental art, pure and simple, the classical phase need not be confined to ancient Greece, the romantic phase need not be confined to a Christian era, and so on. What we will discover, in spite of Hegel, is that the attempt to produce a grand romantic narrative, and romanticism is indeed story-shaped for Hegel, Hegel can't contain a creepy, threatening awareness of non-human beings. Even in Hegel, in other words, the objects that seem only to provide blank slates for the unfolding of the human drama begin to vibrate and move with their own uncanny power. There is a very simple reason for this. There are non-human beings, and these beings also have agency. It's perfectly straightforward for us to say that this now, in a moment of ecological awareness, what interests me is not that Hegel was wrong or whatever, it's that Hegel was so terminally unable to think this thought. So one, the symbolic phase. In this phase, objects outstrip art. The plenitude of art materials and objects overwhelms its spiritual content. This phase collapses. Why? Because as humans get to handle objects and investigate them, they come to know more about them and about themselves. The symbolic phase is represented by Oriental art with its tumult of baffling, for Hegel, forms. Such art is irreflective. It gestures towards thinking but doesn't achieve it. Of course, Hegel is being the Eurocentric imperialist par excellence here. What's of interest to me in this configuration is precisely Hegel's imperialism. He just doesn't see the spiritual content of non-European art, how it's not just a dumb show waiting for real content to be beamed into it from elsewhere. It's this perspective, this attitude that I want to hold and reflect on for a moment. The world of things, and of all the phases Hegel's outlines, Oriental art seems nearest to this world of non-human things, has no intrinsic meaning. It's only later when humans figure out that ideas are different from things, and much later when I, Hegel, come to tell this story that non-human things gain meaning. Isn't there a little bit of awareness of the inverse in this attitude, namely that there are non-human beings that may or may not match up with, all, with our projections onto them? Surely there's something compelling about this thought as we humans enter an ecological age. Hegel's attitude towards the symbolic phase has an inner instability that we will see becoming more significant as we proceed towards thinking this ecological era in perversely Hegelian terms. Two, the classical phase. In this phase, there is a Goldilocks sweet spot in which objects and spirits seem perfectly matched. Hegel finds it embodied, of course, in the art of Greece. Now this phase collapses. Why? Because eventually humans just start to know too much. In this phase, human creativity seems to dance with an unfettered joy, moulding everything to its will in such a way that things seem to reflect it perfectly. But this creativity has a vertiginous inner aspect, such that to a later age, classical art can't help looking a little bit like a repetition compulsion, the mechanical attempt to ward off basic the basic anxiety of this inner space. The soothing mechanisms that confront us in Bach or Pachelbel, for instance, don't they suggest the fantasy of an infinite deferral of something threatening? Isn't there something a little bit true in the cliché that Bach shows no emotion? And if the anxiety could indeed be infinitely deferred, wouldn't this suggest an inner power that was infinite? Thus we would be on a Mobius strip, attempting to thwart the oncoming awareness of inner infinity. We arrive at forms that begin to convey it despite ourselves. Thus the classical phase collapses into the romantic phase. Moreover, doesn't the joy of imposing form on an infinitely plastic world of things strike us as a profound violence? Hegel seems a little seduced by this violence, the sadistic brio of a fugue or a sonata, or to use his examples, sculpture with its noble calm that appears to have wrenched stone from its strife and placed it in a heavenly hall of tranquil mirrors where it reflects back perfectly the human form divine, as the neoclassical Blake put it. Number three, the romantic phase. In this phase, spirit outstrips objects. Infinite inner space is opened up. No external object becomes adequate to convey this inner space, so art must now be about the successful failure to embody the inner world. Now in turn, the romantic phase, just like the phase before it, collapses. But why? This is not predicted in Hegel, nor I claim is it predictable, according to a certain strict Hegelianism. This is because objects themselves begin to speak. The materials that are used to convey the failure to embody the inner start to swirl, drip, and go through their motions with less and less deliberate intervention by the artist. There's something like a straight line in this sense between the blank verse experiments of Wordsworth and the drip paintings of Jackson Pollock. 
Hegel's fantasy is that this is the period when philosophy takes over from art, since art can no longer handle the charismos between objects and spirit. Art must tell the story of its inability to tell the story of the spirit. Irony becomes then the dominant flavour of art, based on a vertiginous awareness of the gap between spirit and art's materials. In the romantic phase, the beyond disappears and reappears within people. God dies and comes down to earth, incarnated in Jesus. A truly Christian art is now possible, better than Gothic cathedrals and Handel's Messiah, in its presentation of the proximity of real other people. It is an ancient mariner, as Coleridge writes, beginning his masterpiece with the uncanny proximity of the stranger. For Hegel, it's irony and vertiginous strangers from here on out. Human strangers. He forgot to add, slowly but surely it creeps up on humans that this strangeness is nothing special, or at least nothing uniquely human. He also forgot to add, to think the death of the beyond is to think the essence of things right here as substances in a weird return to Aristotle. This is the irony of irony as such. The abyss of the subject rolls out the red carpet for the arrival of a monstrous new kind of substance. There is a kind of master-slave dialectic at work here, or, or what Heidegger would call the strife between world and earth. The more you have of landscapes that convey the subjectivity of the implied viewer, the more you have of trees hills and water. The more you express your tortured soul, the more globs of paint you need. The march of the isms, romanticism, realism, impressionism, expressionism, is also the story of the emergence of non-human entities into the very space that appears to be free of them. The very failure of non-human entities to express human depth is what allows those entities to emerge, an emergence we examine today under the heading of emerging critical environments. Consciousness as such that big discovery of the Romantic period isn't exempt from this liberation narrative. Think of Monet's Water Lilies series. Of course what Monet is painting isn't the lilies as such, but the rippling, floating space between the lilies, the space that, in fact, is a substance, water. Einsteinian space-time is also the discovery that space isn't just an empty box. Husserlian intentional consciousness, a much misunderstood and maligned idea, is much the same thing. When I'm thinking something, there I am, thinking it. Consciousness, consciousness itself is no longer a void in which ideas just collide like billiard balls. It's a substance. You can't touch it, you can't see it, but then can you really touch the essence of a billiard ball? Whatever you do will be your anthropomorphic translation of the ball, just as the billiard cue cupomorphizes the ball, um, just as the green bays bays pomorphizes the ball. Writing about music really is like dancing about architecture. Consciousness becomes the prototype of objects in their infinite TARDIS-like strangeness, which we shall now explore. Phase number four, the asymmetric phase. Now let's begin to think the current phase of aesthetics, a phase that has been developing since the start of the Anthropocene out of a structural instability internal to the Romantic phase. When we, discuss, when we compare the asymmetric phase with Hegel's three phases of art, we discover some remarkable parallels and recapitulations. The asymmetric phase is like the symbolic phase, insofar as the world of objects seems to have enormous power and clarity. We know that we carry traces of mercury and radiation in our bodies. We know that gravity waves from the Big Bang are propagating through our bodies. But the asymmetric phase is profoundly unlike the symbolic phase, in that knowledge, science, what we know, rides out to meet the objects in all their infinite variety, from quanta to hypothetical bruise marks of other universes at the edge of our own, from entangled carbon fullerenes to global warming, from humanoids and hominids and hominins to slime molds that can navigate their way around a maze. The asymmetric phase is like the classical phase, insofar as there seems to be an equal match of potency between spirit and objects. Yet the asymmetric phase differs wildly from the classical phase, in that this isn't a Goldilocks balance in any sense. What confronts our inner infinity is an equal and opposite outer infinity, or even more disturbingly, an infinite variety of infinities, a transfinite set that is larger than a simple pair, possibly large beyond magnitude, incalculable, truly infinite, in the Kantian sense, the unconditional freedom of the human being meets the unconditional freedom of a decaying leaf blown into some gutter. The asymmetric phase is like the romantic phase, insofar as spirit is vast and top-heavy. We want, as Percy Shelley puts it, the creative faculty to imagine that which we know. And what a world we know, yet the asymmetric phase differs profoundly from the romantic phase, because it isn't, a sp it, because it isn't spirit that's doing the leading in this dance. It's the objects not the human attitude to them. 
by which I mean that the human attitude is now infected from within by the objectness of objects. Why? What we now see is that non-humans are also filled with infinite inner space. Some of us are ready to grant this inner infinity to certain kinds of sentient being. Some are willing to grant it to all sentient beings. Some are willing to grant it to all life forms. This was my position in the ecological thought. And some still further out are willing to grant it to all non-humans whatsoever, no questions asked. These are the object-oriented ontologists in whose number I now find myself. I see no inherent reason why what I call the strange stranger in the ecological thought can't apply to any entity whatsoever. Fireplaces, the oort cloud at the edge of the solar system, flamingos and slices of pork rotting in a garbage can. Since life forms are made of non-life and what counts as a life form is very much a performative act down to the DNA level, I see no big reason not to extend the concept of strange stranger to cover all entities. So what we confront in the asymmetric phase are infinities everywhere. The universe is suddenly full of TARDISes, all bigger on the inside than they are on the outside. Humans are one of these TARDISes, but so are salt crystals, tsunamis, and 12-inch vinyl techno records. Now, as you can see, there are varying degrees of resistance to granting entities of all kinds the same basic ontological configuration that humans have. Some people still act like the subjectivity equivalent of the custodians of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, granting the inner space parsimoniously to certain higher primates or whatever. Others have completely given up. I count myself in their number. It's as if non-humans have finally infiltrated human, social, psychic and philosophical space with varying degrees of success. The vanguard of this in infiltration was done by what I call hyperobjects, Hyperobjects are objects that are massively distributed in time and space relative to human scales. They are immersive, phenomenologically viscous entities. We exist inside them and as the flowers of their massively branching trees. We find ourselves psychologically, socially, aesthetically, politically glued to them whenever we go, wherever we go. One object I've been studying a great deal is global warming. Say you decide that the solution to global warming is to go to Mars. Then you go to Mars, still under the spell of global warming, and guess what? When you get there, you have to create the atmosphere for yourself, let alone regulate it. You have the same problem magnified even larger. Hyperobjects come in and out of phase with human time and spatial scales because they occupy a much higher dimensional space. Look at the Lorenz attractor, the first strange attractor ever discovered. It was discovered in the attempt to model the phases of weather. The Lorenz attractor lives in a high-dimensional space in which every point is a weather event in 4D space-time. Consider evolution, a hyperobject of which we are a direct product. The possibility space of evolution is just outrageously vast. A map of vectors in this space would be on an order of dimensional magnitude almost unthinkably vast for humans, yet we can't unthink the thought of evolution. These entities, which I call hyperobjects, are the discoveries of modernity, economic forces, the unconscious, evolution, the biosphere, global warming. First we detect them on our instruments, then we realize we are inside them, then they crash into a social, psychic and aesthetic space. This is what e ecological awareness actually is, when the rubber meets the road, oh no, not that phrase again, rather than in some hippie preview. Far from placing human consciousness and power at the centre of the universe, as Kant's perhaps misnamed Copernican Revolution did, hyperobjects are more, or are more really like the Copernican Revolution. You know, the one Copernicus did, in that they force us to coexist with a vast plenum of non-humans, a plenum first sense as the vacuum of space in Pascal's famous line about the silence and stillness of intersidereal spaces filling him with dread. The more we know, the more objects and the more the objectness of objects rises up to meet um, what, what and how we know. So now we encounter this vastness, not as empty space, but as a plenum. Levinas's line about cosmic space is appropriate here. How when I look at the stars, I realize that I'm sought out by inhabitants of the intersidereal spaces. There is no space, there is no abstract other. Only consider what happened to space itself halfway between us and the time of Kant, 1900. There is space-time, an emergent property of large objects, filled with quanta of all kinds, pressing on us like the leering figures of a James Ensor painting. In this object-oriented universe, there's no background that isn't itself an object, like Stephen Dedalus's postal address in a portrait of the artist as a young man. Thus there is no world, no horizon. The background is only a sensual impression of some real object. It truly is the end of the world. This is what it means to inhabit the time of hyperobjects. Art, in the asymmetric phase, has three properties, I claim. One, art as demonic force. Two, 
artist hypocrisy, three, artist collaboration between humans and non-humans. Let's sift through these one by one. One, art as demonic force. Now, art in the asymmetric phase becomes what Socrates calls it an eon, a tuning, an attunement, the channeling of a demonic force. Plato imagines artistic inspiration as an electromagnetic field. It's time we took this granddaddy of aesthetic vehicles out for another spin. Post-1800 physics presents us with a universe of waves, electromagnetic, gravitational, and quantum. Then there are wave-like phenomena such as Lorenz attractors. High-dimensional objects, such as hyperobjects, must be wave-like. Tuning in this respect is attuning the art object, voice, breath, instrument, to these physical waves, quite literally. These waves are somewhat or entirely non-locally distributed. Below the size of an electron, for instance, 10 to the minus 17 centimetres, there is a vast ocean of what? Right down to the Planck length, 10 to the minus 33 centimetres, and possibly lower, strings. Um, it's possible that space-time is an emergent property of objects larger than 10 to the minus 17 centimetres, as Peter Harava of Berkeley has been suggesting. This means that objects below this scale would be everywhere. That is, if we think that quantum theory is telling us something about reality rather than simply acting as a correlation is tool, but in a more mundane sense, Faraday and Maxwell imagined electromagnetic waves, fields, permeating the universe. The same can be said for gravitational fields. They never really zero out, so you can see the cosmic mac microwave background from the beginning of the universe on your TV set when you see TV snow and so on. Somewhat non-local, I'd say. Art becomes tuning to the depth of these fields. Genius is no longer something you are, as in the Romantic period, but something you have. Like in previous periods, you have genius because art is an attunement to a demonic force coming from the non-human and permeating it. As we all know, we've all been strafed by radiation and so on. Let's think of a real example. I can put contact mics on the window of my apartment in San Francisco. They can record sounds for half a year. Then I speed up the recording impossibly fast. Traffic begins to sound like the tinkling of tiny insects. As I speed up the sound, a slow periodic hum begins to become audible. I am now hearing the standing wave caused by pressure changes in the air over the Pacific Ocean. I'm hearing the sound of air over the Pacific. Heidegger argues that every entity is really channeling in this eon-like way. I never hear the wind in itself, only the wind in the chimney, the wind in the trees, or in this case, the air mass contracting and expanding as the Pacific heats and cools. Isn't this very close to what Percy Shelley argues in A Defense of Poetry? Shelley thinks about an Aeolian harp. The Aeolian harp was a wind harp that was very popular in 18th century households like Bose speakers and iPods are now. It gives me a bit of a kick to imagine Jane Austen characters listening to the sonic youth-like sounds that emanate from these harps as they attune to the wind that blows over them as they lie on the window sill on a summer afternoon. Coleridge wrote a poem called The Aeolian Harp in which he imagines all organic nature to be a series of such harps and Shelley does something similar, allowing for the possibility that every sentient being is like one of these harps. We tune to the environment, then we tune to our tuning. That is called thinking. So Shelley has produced a physicalist model of thinking probably based on materialist theories of mind influenced by the recent discovery of the human nervous system. I can't help wanting to play an example here. Um... And when I hear this, I always imagine now some strange Jane Austen-like moment where, you know, Oh, Mr. Bingley, Mr. Bingley! You know, people drinking tea in the living room and listening to this sonic youth sound. So here we go for a sec. But Heidegger goes one step further and argues that every entity in the universe is an Aeolian harp, not just the sentient ones, or even the living ones. Every entity is modulating every other entity. Mercury in the thermometer tells me about my body temperature. Photons hitting my optic nerve tell me about the mercury. Transducers in my ears tell me about pressure waves, translating them into electrochemical signals that I hear as sound. 
The dinosaur-shaped hole in the fossilized mud tells me about the dinosaur that, I was, that was walking over the mud. The computer model tells me about global warming. This Aeolian channeling is an art built out of causal effects between objects, which are, on my view, entirely aesthetic. A footprint, a software model, a sound, the pulsation of the air. All these are aesthetic phenomena. They are interobjective, that is, they inhabit some etheric, shared space between objects, a space that can only in and of itself consist of more objects. Art that talks about these shared effects has two modes. Shellian, or Wordsworthian, which is to talk about relations, and Keatsian, which is to give some impossible glimpse of the real object that subtends those relations. Because relations are Shelley poems, vast, sprawling, non-local, dizzying, spiralling, constructivist, but objects are Keats poems, unspeakable, unique, black hole-like. Two, hypocrisy. This has two components. A, weakness, and B, irony. A, weakness. The object, one plus n of them, exists ontologically prior to your art, and art's form and content are now asymmetrical. We know so much about real entities, modern science, yet precisely because of this they loom uncannily towards us, getting stranger by the minute. All our representations are inadequate. We've kept this from the romantic phase. Since we are inside at least one of these objects, for instance global warming, and since inside the hyper-object we are always in the wrong, to parody Kierkegaard, art becomes an art of lameness and weakness, Nietzschean impulses are vanquished by sliding underneath them, like, like a scared little vole or a slime mould. This in particular ends the Nietzscheanism of contemporary Marxian critique. B. Irony. Rather than a vertiginous anti-realist abyss, irony presents us with intimacy with one plus n objects that already exist. Irony is the canary in the coal mine of the hyper-object, a symptom that existed even during the Romantic phase. The vicissitudes of this life are like drowning in a glass pond. Irony is the experience of total sincerity, of being enveloped by a hyper-object, of being Jonah in the whale, realising that he is part of the whale's digestive system. Irony is coexistence without centre or edge. Ecological art that tries to delete irony, then, is trying to unthink what was learned during the Romantic phase. This is impossible, and the attempt is dangerously regressive. What ecological thinking needs to know is that irony isn't an optional extra, it's intrinsic to the strangeness of non-humans. Three, art is a collaboration between humans and non-humans. Point one and point two, and their scientific underpinning, we know about global warming, gravity waves, and so on, give rise to a necessary knowledge about smaller scale, medium-sized objects, such as paintings and poems. Relativity affects pencils and professors flying at altitude above Earth. When you write a poem, you are making a deal with some paper, some ink, word processing software, trees, editors, and air, and so on. And given point two, you have to wonder whether your poem about global warming is really a hyper-object's way of distributing itself into human ears and libraries. And given number one, even your poem that isn't about global warming takes place on the inside of a hyper-object, and so it's a function of that object in some sense. Now, since there are real objects, and since causality itself is an Aeolian harp-like transduction of energies, a translation of one object in terms of another, since causality just is the aesthetic dimension, in other words, then some translations are better than others. How are they better? Somehow they tune to the object in a more powerful, more convincing, more revealing way. What would perfect tuning look like? It would look like death. When an object perfectly tunes another one, it becomes that object, or vice versa. It was so beautiful I almost died. Kantian beauty is already an attunement between two beings, a subject and an object, in which the subject discovers something surprising. It's capable of having an experience outside its ego shell. Beauty is what happens when an object and its tuning fit so snugly that they fuse together in a kind of loving extinction. Beautiful death. It happens because an object and its sensual qualities are riven from each other. There is an irreducible charismos between an object and that object's appearance for another object. Objects are self-contradictory and fragile. They are mortal. They contain a secret wound, a, hom a, a hamartia, that makes them vulnerable to at least one magic bullet. More and more, Art in the asymmetric phase tries to come as close to that magic bullet as possible. So art in the asymmetric phase is a little bit threatening, reminding us of death, beautiful death. Like a sound that was so beautiful you couldn't stop listening to it, but so loud and in tune with your body that it began to take you apart on a cellular level. Art 
becomes an object that almost kills you. The asymmetric phase retroactively reconfigures the phases that came before it. In particular, it now seems clear that the romantic phase wasn't simply a moment at which spirit became too big for its boots. It was also the phase in which environments emerged within the humanities and the arts. And what are these environments? Nothing other than non-human entities in all their mysterious, vibrant wonder and horror, filling us with guilt and shame, decentering our place in the universe. Thank you very much.